Good morning. My name is Timothy Cook. I'm from Fredericksburg, Texas. I um, work with uh, Contemplative Outreach with uh, San Antonio and in other parts. And uh, good morning. I'll be asking Thomas some questions uh, that we have taken from the, um, from the ecumenism box. And um, it was pointed out to me this morning um, that uh, yesterday was the beginning, uh, marks 40 years since the beginning of the Vatican II Council. And so one of my questions I'd like to ask Father Keating this morning is the implications of that council 40 years later for an ecumenical gathering such as we're participating in today and the renewal of uh, the prayer of contemplation. I'm, I'm starting with the easy questions first. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, the uh, Second Vatican Council was a, a marked a 180-degree change in the Roman Catholic attitude towards uh, other Christian denominations and uh, in some degree even of the other world religions. So it was, uh, it was wonderful news for me. I had uh, a dear grandma who was an Episcopalian <laughs> and I was terribly worried about her salvation. <laughs> As a small boy growing up with, uh, uh, in a, uh, taught by an, a very wonderful nun, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> my mother also was not a Catholic, but she was more of a Bible Christian. But it, it, after Vatican II, it was such a relief. And I, I was raised in uh, mostly uh, non-Catholic schools. So most of my friends were non-Catholics. It was such a relief not to have to dislike them. <laughs> <laughs> but you, as you know, before then, uh, Catholics couldn't go into a Protestant church. You couldn't attend a wedding offered by a non-Catholic minister. It was pretty tight. Well. At the Vatican Council, it changed 180 degrees through the movement of that uh, council, and it's still developing. There was a lot of ecumenical movement at first. It was very exciting, as perhaps some of you were around for that. But uh, let me quote. I just was going to quote this in my little talk. But here is here's Pope John the uh, Second, Pope John Paul the Second. I say, he says, the promotion of human unity belongs to the innermost nature of the church. And that's a good quotation. And the church here, I think, refers to every Christian denomination. So it has shifted the focus from, from trying to persuade one another's membership that they ought to join ours. The, the emphasis has now become on trying to create communion among the different uh, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox communions. In other words, the, the prayer, Jesus' prayer for unity has, 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 has been upgraded <laughs> and, and has finally drawn the attention of people, and, and I'm very hopeful. Here is what, um, what the, one of the council documents had to say about this, too. The church must function, says this document, as a, a sacramental sign and an instrument of intimate unity with God and, an, uh, and of the unity of all humankind. So that extends our perspectives to the, to the other world religions. And, and really, if, um, when you think about it, uh, there's much more that unites the Christian churches I talked about uh, baptism this morning. So, I mean, if we're all baptized, we already have an enormous source of, of unity and agreement between us, so that all the other disagreements seem to me to pale in, in relationship 
to that basic unity. So, so everybody who's baptized is in the body of Christ, or as Paul says, is in Christ Jesus. So before we, uh, before we think about any differences, we already have this extraordinary unity of each being a cell in the mystical body of Christ. And that means the Holy Spirit of Christ dwells in each of us, like the soul dwells in every part of the body, at least in uh, Aristotelian anthropology. But I think it's, it's, it's true. We know the cells work for the good of the whole body. And so there's a, there's also the famous DNA. Each cell has a program of what is good for the whole body. So the divine DNA, so to speak, is the Holy Spirit that dwells in each of us and has communicated to us the code of divine transformation. So as I was saying this morning, it's all there waiting to be activated, that is to come to our consciousness that, uh, that we are truly the body of Christ. And uh, personally, I think this extends to everybody in grace, not just the baptized. And if you believe uh, Karl Rahner, who says nature is graced, then uh, people, perhaps everybody is born in a state of grace. Don't quote me, please. <laughs> just, just a private opinion, yes. <laughs> Next question. Dear Thomas, could you speak to the potential of contemplative and centering prayer to bridge diverse faith communities? Uh, well, as you know, I, I, one of the whole uh, motives for contemplative outreach as an organism, an organization, if you prefer, was to uh, further Christian unity by granting people across all the denominations the same vital and dynamic experience of the living Christ within us at the deepest level. And so I think it really has happened. Uh, uh, we, we have groups that uh, consist of many different denominations. As far as I know, they never discuss their differences on a doctrinal level. They're too busy working on the false self <laughs> <laughs> and, and enjoying the bonding that takes place when one uh, uh, accesses that deep pool of interior silence that is available to, uh, available to us all and which is the Spirit's gift of quiet, of rest, of peace, of silence, and of love and, and utter freedom. So, so what's the use of arguing with someone with whom you're sharing that experience? It, it has a certain value because it wouldn't be needed to, uh, to solve disagreements. But, but I think Centering Prayer contributes to the possibility of the unity of the churches through that sense of bonding in, that takes place in sharing the same uh, deep spiritual experience. What is the greatest impediment to mutual understanding among Christians? Pride. <laughs> the thought that we're better than others, maybe because of our religion, religious commitment. I don't. I don't think. Uh, I, I don't think there's the basic difference. We just think there's a difference, uh, and magnify that idea. There are differences. What I'm trying to say is that the principle of unity through baptism and being together in the body of Christ is, uh, puts other differences into a perspective that is, should be a, a easy to handle. And I, 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 do, I would hope that in, in this century that uh, the leaders of the different communions would uh, as they've already started to do, try to come together on many levels. I think the Lutherans and the Episcopalians have reached a certain agreement. I think this is wonderful. 
and even the, uh, I think even the uh, Episcopal, uh, the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics agreed on what justification by grace is, which was the chief bone of contention in the 16th century, was it, or 15th? I thought that was wonderful. My only thought was, why couldn't they have figured this out a little sooner? <laughs> 500 years to figure out the, the, the whole disagreement was, was a mistake in the first of understanding in the first place. How can we foster centering prayer among individuals who do not participate in organized Christianity but seek a deeper spiritual life? Well, this is an interesting question because uh, our original intent was, number one, to try to uh, renew the Christian contemplative heritage, especially for our own tradition, the Roman Catholic, and, and then to make it available to anybody in the Protestant or Reformed communions or, or who might want to do the same. At the time of the Reformation, the contemplative uh, understanding or, or, or the tr contemplative tradition was at a very low ebb. So there was, there was no tradition to take with them when they left uh, the Roman Catholic communion. And I suspect that's why they left. They were looking for a spirituality that was not being projected at that time by the, uh, in the Roman communion. But suppose someone is seeking God and, and has no special religion, or as many people today uh, are brought up at home without any special religion or, or, uh, or certainly no significant influence in their lives. And so what do they do when they begin to feel a calling from God, and maybe through nature or through service of others or, or other channels that God draws people to? to himself through. Um, what, I, what, what I learned in, in, in prison, not so much from staying there. <laughs> no need to laugh. I probably deserve to be there. I was, certainly there's some people there that are a lot holier than I am that I've met. But uh, what we learned in, in one prison was that the, the men on the yard, that is to say the non-attached to religious things, will never go to a, a, a chapel for a religious service. That's not, that's not their interest. They're angry at God sometimes as well as society. Uh, and so there's no chance of reaching them uh, through the usual services of a chaplain. So what happened at Folsom was that some of the men themselves learned how to do the prayer and they set up their own little uh, group. And then they sent for instruction uh, from, uh, from the group at Los Angeles. And, and, and Gus Reininger went up there. And, and, but one of the men, some, of, some people in prison are very smart. Uh, <laughs> He said he, he went to each one of the gang leaders in the prison and invited them personally to come. Because without the OK of gang leaders, since they were still very powerful even in prison, it would be dangerous to go to something that didn't have the approval of the local warlord. So, so they came, and they, they rather liked the presentation, and they gave it their endorsement. They're imprimatur, so to speak. <laughs> Things are a little reversed in prison. <laughs> so, so with their support, then, these other men could, uh, could offer it to people on the yard, and they did so. And, and people on the yard, they didn't proselytize. They didn't try to develop candidates. But the men could see the changes in them. And they said they're, what they were looking for was a self-help program that seemed to work. Now, we know the only reason it works, centering prayer, is because of God, not us. We didn't tell them that, of course. <laughs> so they started coming. So as soon as they started joining the F contemplative fellowship, as it was called, they began experiencing the benefits. 
centering prayer, you know? More peace, less anger, more ability to deal with difficult circumstances, and God knows that circumstances are just awful in prisons. So, so it, it convinced me, uh, I should have known this, but that's why I'm, I'm talking so much about the love of God, and we underestimate it. In other words, to make this transformation available to, to those who felt themselves excluded and, in fact, didn't want to come, to, make, uh, to, to find an entrance into their hearts, he, he, he found uh, the way of silence. So, so I think that centering prayer can really be offered to people without any religious background. Actually, uh, the 12 steps of AA start there, too. I mean, uh, they're really a great insight into the, uh, into the Christian uh, spiritual journey. So, so God is prepared to bend over backwards to reach people. And so I think you can invite people into the group if it's appropriate. And uh, as long as they don't mind the jargon, the little, little religious jargon once in a while, they may, may be their door into, into, uh, into a return to their religion of their childhood uh, or uh, to a deeper, uh, their own personal relationship with God. Does that? Yes. And that relates to uh, another problem with uh, people's idea of God <coughs> separates them from their experience. Yes. Actually, if we have a negative idea of God, you'd be better off to be an atheist. <laughs> because at least you wouldn't have a negative attitude <laughs> towards God. So we all have to be careful of, of, our, uh, of any emotionally charged thoughts of God that we might have brought with us from early childhood because of uh, well-intentioned but psychologically inept instruction of a religious kind that, that emphasize the dangerous aspect of God and, and the punishment and hell fire and so on. This is not the proper education for children. They need to be encouraged to trust God. But obviously, if, if on the unconscious level, one still has an emotional fear of God, or uh, that is to say, an emotionally charged. So when the, thought of, when the word God goes off, you think of a policeman, a judge, or a tyrant. You're not going to want to make friends with this entity. And, and so the, sometimes the first job we need to do in, in, in order to not be afraid of entering into a close union with God is, is to dump those thoughts. And I mean dump. Uh, throw them in the ash can. This is not the God of the Christians. And uh, if you quote back to me a few uh, hair-raising tales from the Old Testament about the vengefulness of God, I, I don't think those are to be taken literally. I think they're, they're projections of the people who wrote in those times, and they represent their cultural background. They don't necessarily represent any accurate description of how God felt about the situation. So we have to read scripture with a little bit of uh, critical judgment uh, nowadays and realize that, that some of the books of the Old Testament really represent a cultural level that is quite primitive in regard to ideas of God. So, that's as best they could do at that time. I can remember, uh, I think, the cursing psalms, for instance, feed into the pathology of certain pious but angry people who take delight in shouting uh, deprecations against their enemies in the local community uh, as a way of venting their, their spleen rather than their devotion. We once had a, had, a, had a monk at the monastery who uh, 
was very unhappy because of certain things in the community. And, and during vigils, which takes place in four o'clock in the morning in those days, which is, one isn't always in the best dispositions at that time anyway, <laughs> When you get to the deprecations about asking God to bring down various horrors on your enemies, he would start bellowing, that is to say, and it was perfectly clear to everybody that, that these words were not directed at God, but at them. <laughs> oh God, bring my enemies to nothing, reduce them to dust and all the rest of it. But he, he felt so good after vigils that <laughs> he kept this up. I finally had the duty as abbot of, of forbidding him to come to the uh, to vigils. <laughs> the peace of mind of the rest of the group. Some of you who are religious superiors may resonate with this story in some other way. I'm not sure. OK? As I understand ecumenism, it focuses on openness within Christian traditions. Shouldn't we, shouldn't we be focusing on linkage within all spiritual traditions? Thank you. Uh, yes, I think that's true, but I think it's, it, it, it especially is important to start at home, so to speak, uh, to begin closer to home. But it very quickly, as soon as you, uh, you begin to move with this attitude of openness, it begins to extend to other religions and to all creation. It doesn't mean that you, well, it's worth saying that at least in the Roman Catholic communion, now it's, there are many theologians, and, and indeed the Holy Father himself, is saying that the Spirit of God is at work in the other world religions. In other words, they also have a revelation of God. And that some of their uh, practices are salvific. That is, they also are like sacraments that, that lead to grace or build on grace. So, so here again, this is a great step forward, it seems to me. An enormous change in former attitudes, which incidentally have not trickled down to the pews as yet. Or, or, or vice versa. <laughs> Sometimes people in the pews have it before the people higher, higher up in the galleries have, that is to say, in the pulpit. But, but, but this, is, this is an enormous freedom. And, and I think it's appropriate in our time when, when, the, when it, the work of religions, uh, especially Christian denominations, is really to try to build bridges, to try to heal wounds of the past, of the historical past. For instance, the, in the Orthodox communion, uh, the sack of, of Constantinople is remembered as if it happened yesterday, and it was 900 years ago. If you're a Roman Catholic and, and join the Orthodox Church in some quarters, you'd have to be rebaptized. and. Uh, they're likely to throw you out of, of Mount Athos if you venture there. And so on. But this is, this is so sad. But it, it's, it's the inheritance of generations of, of anger over a, a tragedy that is terribly reprehensible. But somehow forgiveness has to come in there. And uh, somebody has to start it. And so whatever we can do to build rec reconciliation. Reconciliation doesn't mean agreement, but it means respect, understanding, a willingness to learn from other religions. And the best, uh, probably, credentials for interreligious dialogue is, is to know your own tradition well, because then you have a place that, uh, from which to speak intelligently and out of experience with other traditions who also have a very spiritual traditions. And in, in our time, especially America seems to be the providential place in which uh, relig interreligious dialogue can take place at, with the greatest freedom. It happens to be our political culture. So I think our 
North America has, has a marvelously providential role in providing a milieu in which people can freely speak of their tradition. In another generation, uh, your grandchildren will be marrying Buddhists and Hindus, Sikhs and Taoists and Sufis and whatnot, because they'll be all around you. And the population, the, uh, the demographics are, uh, indicate that in another 50 years, there'll be more Asians and Hispanics in America than uh, Caucasians or Europeans. So the interesting transformation of, so you might as well start learning Spanish now. <laughs> we'll continue with the questions in English for the time being. <laughs> What is the relationship of con uh, contemplative outreach, centering prayer, to the Buddhist uh, prayer practices and other um, contemplative uh, traditions, like Hindus and Buddhists? Well, in many ways they're comparable, but in, in, in also in other ways uh, they're distinct. And the subtleties of those distinctions require a little bit of background and experience. And, uh, Oh, oh, the spiritual traditions of the East are going in the same direction. They, you know, they're, give it different names, but enlightenment, for instance, is another word really for transformation. Um, and uh, there are stages of, of, uh, of advancing consciousness that we probably would feel more comfortable calling, for the moment at least, uh, levels of faith. So. So there's, there's, uh, it's clear that in every one of the, of the spiritual traditions of the world religions, there are, there are stages and symptoms that go with each one. And as you look at the symptoms, you see that they're comparable across almost all the world religions in many respects. So uh, what Centering Prayer offers is a, a method of accessing those levels of consciousness and of transformation, we would say through the development of the theological virtues and the fruits and the gifts, that's our theological language, but you could express it in somewhat different terms. All of the world religions are, are aware of the false self and of needless suffering and uh, caused by the false self, of the, uh, of the true self and uh, of uh, stages of enlightenment. We, we may be at a moment in, in human evolution that is crucial, or as some philosophers call it, axial, that is to say, a paradigm shift of consciousness from the, by the general public from one uh, significant level of general awareness to the next ones. 5,000 years ago, we moved roughly from mythic membership consciousness as a whole to mental egoic consciousness, which is rational consciousness. Well, now the question is, is there, an, after 5,000 years, is humanity as a whole ready to move to what seems to be the next one as, it, as experienced in the great mystics of, of all the world traditions? And that one would be the intuitive. Well, in centering prayer, that's what you're cultivating, the intuitive level of your consciousness, not as an end in itself, but as a doorway to still higher development which is available as individuals, but not yet available in, um, in the general population. It's those who, who reach a high, full enlightenment or full transformation are still, unfortunately, very few. What would happen if a certain number of persons uh, reached that place? It would change, it would change the, con uh, the consciousness of the whole world because the higher levels of consciousness, since they're rooted in a greater expression of divine love, are vastly more powerful than all the negativity around. In fact, I read somewhere, and it's just one man's opinion of this, uh, according to his research, he thinks that one person who had reached a f the full uh, calibration, as he calls it, of, of, of human consciousness in, in, in a transformed state. One person would, would balance 
the, neg the negativity of all the rest of the world. Uh, someone with a calibration a little lower might affect 70 million people. Not bad job. <laughs> so you have no idea of what you're getting into. <laughs> of, the, of the, not your power, but the empowerment of allowing God to act in you and to allow, and allow divine love, the greatest force, well, it's the source of all creation, to, to manifest itself not by great deeds, but just by changing your being. So that perhaps the greatest thing you can do is to be transformed and to work on the, on the baptismal commitment, death to the false self and allow the true self to be whatever it's going to be. We have no idea what the state of transformation feels like. None. It, it can't be imagined. But as Paul says, uh, it hasn't entered into the mind of a man what God has prepared for those who love him. You just can't possibly imagine it. But what, what the, the scriptures are telling us is that it's totally available. And we just think it's hard. We just think it's difficult. We just think it's out of reach. We just think you have to uh, uh, enter a monastery <laughs> or, <laughs> or uh, do all kinds of penance. God really doesn't need any penance. He really doesn't need any monasteries, apart from your need to go on retreat. <laughs> All he needs is to allow him to love us. And the best way to do that is to shut up and do nothing. But when you do that, you will then know what to do. Not any bright ideas of yours, but then all the divine empowerment will flow through you and you, you will do without always being aware of it, all kinds of things that you never even thought of. And, and I like this idea of calibration. It means that without your knowing it, if you, as you climb the ladder of consciousness, you, you may uh, affect or, or balance off the negativity of millions of people. I mean, I, I don't think too small about that. You say, oh, who am I to do this? That's not humility. That's nonsense. <laughs> Nobody's anything anyway. There's, there's no chosen souls, because everybody is chosen. And, and, and our weakness or our addictions or our background are not really obstacles to God. He, he can handle all this stuff. The only thing he asks of us is the free acceptance of himself as infinite love. And that is possible. All you need to do is to be able to love and to be able to suffer. And most people can do that. Uh, we have time for just, I think, two more questions. This is kind of a personal question, but uh, the, the, they would like to know, uh, this person would like to know if you mind sharing your age. Not at all. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, uh, apart from being eternal, <laughs> uh, you can see I'm, I'm, I'm not a believer in time anymore. I, uh, it's only a projection of the mind. But for those of you who still project such things as time, <laughs> I, I'm 79 and a half. As, you, as usual, we have many more questions than we have time for, but our last question is, if Jesus showed up here today, what would he tell us? How in the world would I know? <laughs> but, but I'm sure he wouldn't say another stupid question. <laughs> because I'm... <laughs> be, be, because I'm sure he wouldn't say that. <laughs> 
the apostles were always asking stupid questions, and he, he never blamed them. He, he, he sort of rolled with their stupidity in the punches and just kept on loving them, never upbraided them for their faults, but he pointed them out. And, and the same spirit that prompted Jesus in dealing with his disciples is working in us right now, especially through centering prayer and the effort to bring its effects into daily life. So you, you really are being led by the Spirit. And once you sense this, as you read Scripture, you see your own life mirrored in the happenings in the people, because the Spirit deals with us in the same way. He's usually asking us, why are you doing that? Or who are you? Or where is your faith? Or, why are you afraid? These are the same questions that go on all the time in our life. 